Uh, welcome to the February 1st Board of Directors meeting. We will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we will begin with our public input statement read by our vice chair. Oh, who doesn't have it because she can't get online? Um, you know what? 20, 21 minutes, you get three minutes to speak in your name and town you're from. No personnel issues. And I think that's it. Okay, can't find it. So we will begin public input. Hi, uh, my name is Charles Glomo, North Berwick. Um, I came because I'm really bothered by the talk of arm, arming people in schools. I mean, it's, it's a great way to get a cheap applause line, but if you take five minutes and really think about it, realize what a horribly misguided idea that is. Teachers go into education, it's in their mindset. They go to school for it, they train for it. People who go into law enforcement have a certain mindset to protect and to serve, and they train for that, and they keep up that training because you need to be in top shape to make that quick decision on whether that person is a friend or foe. <clears throat> Even bringing in so-called non-lethal weapons isn't a solution. People have died from being tased. A beanbag gun is designed to take down a full-grown man much larger than myself and will leave them with severe scarring and bruising. What would happen if one of those accidentally discharged and hit a first grader? Every weapon you bring in increases the risk. And it increases exponentially when you put it in the hands of persons who are not fully trained. You, as a school board, are responsible for the safety of the students and the employees of this district. To abdicate that duty and say it's up to the teachers is just wrong. You need, you will really only have two choices in this matter. Either you decide the risk isn't great enough to warrant the expenditure of funds, or you suck it up and you hire a professional, a law enforcement officer, to do the duty. Thank you. Other public input? Good evening, Valerie Higgins, Lebanon, Maine. I am here to discuss an issue that's concerning for my husband and I. We have a six-year-old at Hanson School in special education. His name is Wyatt. Um, we have had a problem with threatening, bullying, and intimidation uh, by administration. And it started last fall. It's continued through November and most recently uh, involving Wyatt's absences. Since he started school, he's missed an incredible amount of time from being sick. We're trying to get to the bottom of it. Prior to him starting school, he was never sick. Never sick, never saw the doctor. I raised the issue that it might be an issue with the building. Maybe he's allergic to something, carpeting something that's causing this. And I immediately then got a letter that stated that maybe, I mean, Wyatt's missed a, an a large amount of time, we're very concerned about it, you need to make sure he gets here, and you need to make sure he gets to school on time, which I thought was kind of ironic because it's your school, your transportation department that picks up Wyatt. He's a special needs child. Last fall when he started school, I was very upset. Um, his IEPs all say that he uh, has a special diet. We, I make everything for him for his school lunches. We do not eat pork. It's part of our deep-rooted faith. 
He was fed a ham sandwich the first week of school. They ignored his lunch. I raised the issue. And the response I got was, oh, we're sorry, but why were you taking pictures and video of the school bus? Well, he's six years old. He's autistic. It's the first time he's ever been on a school bus. We worked really hard as therapists, his school teachers. Everyone worked awesome. They were, I can't say enough about the staff that um, helps our grandson. He's just, they're just amazing. His teacher, his therapist, awesome. But we were then admonished for taking a video of him getting on the bus for the very first time. And I responded with, well, the United States Supreme Court has ruled that public spaces are, there's no expectation of privacy in public spaces. So you cannot restrict parents from videotaping their children on a public road, on a public school bus, in a public school. So I, I, I don't, you know, it's like we're, we're getting targeted. And, and then in November, it was about his um, exemption from immunizations. It's all through his paperwork, his IEPs. And um, we were told, well, we need a letter from the doctor. Okay? Not urgent. Just when seconds. you get around to it, um, can you please get a letter? Then it became an urgency. So it's just been nonstop, and we really would like it to stop. I think it is counterproductive. It should be more that we should all be working together for the benefit of these kids, especially the special needs kids, and not alienating the parents. And it's, uh, it's I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank, okay. you. Thank you. Other public input? <laughs> then we will move on to the minutes of the January 18th meeting. Oh, that's somebody. Right. I somebody. Some place said, "Mr. Uh, Mr. Travers." And I should have been Mrs. Okay. Sorry if I changed. Sorry, Scott. You got the. Uh, I got the. Yeah. 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 And and did you correct the broke? Broken. Yes. Breaks. Yeah. Oh, that's weird. Why? Yeah. I think I did. Mean, it was this. It was right there. It was right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. Right there. Anything else? Oh, yeah. Mr. Travers. Oh, I make the motion to approve the minutes. The Do you have a second? All in favor? There's a nice. She's got her hand up. Yeah, she got her hand up. Next on the agenda is a student data presentation by Dr. Shannon Slager. Come on down. Yes. So, um, Dr. Swiger is going to present here. So that means we need to move down here. So the I'll carry with me, Kate. Thank you. Should be able, you should be able to hit it there. Josh. Yeah, that's back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, not again, public speaking. 
so I'm going to let my heart rate just slow down for one second. Um, but we had a few questions from a board member, and we're just going to take some time and review each question. Um, shouldn't take too long. The first question was, when will we receive and be able to review the main three-year 23 NWA data for our district? So we just received that data recently. And uh, with a caveat from the DOE, so I just wanted to read that. It says, these results are considered preliminary because they include data from all students who assessed, including students who would not meet FAY status, so full academic year status. As a result, these results are not intended for public consumption, but are instead intended to aid SAUs in understanding and interpreting the results. So public data will become available on the DOE's ESSA dashboard, which anyone at any time could go on there. There are, um, there's data all the way back from 2017 and 18. So we were kind of waiting until they made the data public, but we can talk about the data now briefly since we had this request. Um, Do you have any indication as to why it would go public? They just said this year. <laughs> yeah, they're pretty specific. Um, but I've been checking on the weekly. Thank you, Pastor. Yes, yes, I will. And I know this is hard to see for folks in the back, but again, it will be publicly on um, the DOE's website. So this is the state's, I want to say, sixth iteration of a state assessment. And last spring, we took for the very first time the main NWA through year assessment. So that was its first administration. This was our staff and our students and the DOE's first time kind of navigating this new platform. On the left, you will see our results for reading. So it is the percentage of students who are at or above state expectation in reading. The maroon bar is MSAD 60, and the gray bar next to it represents the state average. Um, and we can talk, in the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about how the DOE is determining achievement. Um, just quick observations. I think for the first go at this assessment, um, the reading scores look promising, and we are excited to continue to increase. Um, Depending on the grade level, we range from about 60 to 70 percent of our students meeting state expectation for reading. We have four grade levels that are slightly above the state average, and we have a few who are slightly below the state average. Shannon, I'm, I'm sorry. Do you mind just saying what grade levels are being actually in the bars? Yeah, I can't see them. So it's below third, them. it's third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and tenth grade. Okay. So grades three through eight in the second year of high school are assessed by the state. Um, so again, ranging from about sixty percent to seventy of our students met state expectation according <laughs> to the DOE's criteria, which we will get into in a second. Um, if you look at the right. We have our math percentages. Um, you can note that both the maroon and the gray bars take quite a dip. Um, I think the message that we've heard across the state and nationally was that the content area that's taken the biggest hit in terms of the impact of our instructional loss during COVID was, has been math. Um, so we're not the only district kind of feeling this pain right now. But, again, we're excited to improve those scores. If you think about that sixth grade, which is kind of the middle bar and our lowest um, maroon bar, those sixth graders were third graders <coughs> in 1920 when COVID hit and we went remote. They were also, um, that was the year that K-5 and our middle school started two new math programs. So those third graders never got the full implementation of that curriculum. Uh, we know in March when we went remote, that student attendance for remote sessions um, varied. We also know that just uh, the rigor of some of that remote instruction could not replicate what would occur in the classroom. 
Then in, let's see, so that's 1920, 2021, we were in a hybrid model where we had a shortened week, shortened days. We were remote one day, um, and the other four were shortened for elementary. We also had about 300 students who chose full remote for that year. So again, just trying to, they, they hadn't gotten that exposure to the full curriculum. 21-22, uh, we still had a lot of fluctuating absences um, from COVID, and then and last year they took the state assessment as sixth graders. So just kind of showing that perhaps one of the reasons was just that instructional time that was lost and the impact that COVID had. But we've got some good things in place, and improving our math scores is definitely one of our top priorities. The next question. It's not moving. Okay. <laughs> hmm. frozen. It's frozen. There we go. So really wanting to understand more how the state is determining the achievement of our school district. There are a lot of technical guides. Um, if you go on the DOE website, really dense guidelines about the development of this new state assessment, kind of the psychometrics that went involved in the, its development and the scoring. But I really tried to pare this down to digestible chunks. So, those percentages that you just saw in the last slide were based on the spring administration of the three-year assessment. And they have with, they partnered with NWA and they have um, created a main specific scale score. So it is not, those of you who are familiar with NWA, uh, usually think of the RIT score, which is the norm reference score. And the three-year assessment is one test produces two very different scores and the state uses determines achievement based on this main specific scale score um, so the main specific scale score is determined based only on the summative portion of the assessment so think end of year expectations all third graders should know all fourth graders must demonstrate so mastery of standards, the common core standards. The main specific scale score is a criterion reference score. They are aligned to specific performance expectations or standards, and they report performance according to those standards. And uh, it reports a student's performance in relation to grade level standards. So unlike a norm reference score where you are compared to how you perform amongst a group of peers. This is really about your mastery of content and skills. So end of the year, think of your driver's test. You know, they are gonna score you on what you've mastered. They're not gonna give you a score on how you did relative <coughs> to the 10 other people who were there that day. You need to master the standards um, and the skills. So a little bit more on how the state came up with that. Every question on that summative portion of the three-year assessment, so think about the test, three-fourths are summative, and the other fourth is more diagnostic, um, which produces the RIT score. Every question is written to align to both a standard and an achievement level of well below, below, at, or above state expectations. Sorry if I'm talking too fast. Um, they used a combined process of the alignment study, embedded standard setting, and response probability policy decision. Determine the cut scores within the designated score range. So for the main specific scale score, you can get anywhere from a 14 to 1600. A 1500 to, I think, 1524 gets you at um, your meeting state expectation. And again, they get really technical, and I didn't want to get really technical. I hope that kind of sounded like it was digestible. But again, the DOE is very uh, responsive and receptive. If you have additional questions more about 
the test development, its validity, the scoring. Um, Krista is an amazing resource. I have her phone number and her email there. Feel free to reach out. I feel like I'm contacting her on the regular um, just to help with explanations, and she's very helpful. So those percentages were based on a main scale score, and the last two slides kind of talked about how the state um, came to those scale scores. So, next question. Does the district have any alignment data between NWA RIT scores, ELA Common Core State Standard, and of Unit Assessment scores, Eureka Map? In a more general sense, does the district have any data comparing multiple data points of assessment data from different assessments over the course of any number of years? Um, the answer is yes. We have been doing this for a long time, but the answer is also it's complicated because as a district, we, we want to use one of our markers as a state assessment, and it keeps changing every two years. So like that longitudinal component has been challenging. We have had data walls from 2016 prior to myself even being in this position all the way to now. They kind of evolve every year. We couldn't fit them all or show every example, so these are just two kind of screenshots, partial, of various data walls, and we put that watermark there just because it can't tell, this little snapshot can't tell you a full picture. We, there's some sensitive information in terms of building names, you know it. So, um, for example, the, the box on the left. So as a district team, we sat together, we got the results from the 2017 MEAs. This was the old state test. We sorted uh, students where they fell, above, at, below, and then we compare that at that time with other common data points like our STAR spring scores, the STAR independent reading level, and our Fountas and Pinnell benchmark. Um, teams sat together, you sort through that data, you, um, you notice and wonder, sometimes a student is in alignment, sometimes you're going to see an outlier, and that really has you questioning, like, why did they do great on the state assessment, but may have struggled on the STAR, is it a vocabulary, is it a background? So it really ignites really great conversations. Often data, when you're triangulating it, doesn't always align. And then it tells you really a bigger picture of the learner. So that's just to show you like examples of what we've done. On the right is a more recent little tiny snapshot where when we switched over to map growth for a couple of years from the state, we used our benchmark fall, winter, spring against NWEA to kind of see if they are aligning or not aligning, telling different stories. If they do, what are we missing for specific learners? Because we really want to help inform our instruction. Um, the bottom, which you can't see if you're sitting back there, is just to kind of demonstrate. So the longitudinal big district picture has been hard because we've gone from the kneecap to smarter balance to empower me to no state test to math growth to through year. So now that we have the through year and it seems to be staying around for a while, our new data wall will um, incorporate those scaled scores, grit scores, our benchmark assessments, our math scores, etc. The next slide is um, a building level. Our building um, data walls are amazing. And um, again, just two examples. The top left, you know, you're seeing independent reading levels with high frequency words, NWA reading, words their way. Again, um, teams become really skilled at sorting this information. It's color coded. It probably doesn't mean a lot for those of you who aren't working with this, but you're wondering, you know, if someone's meeting an expectation, why are they a red here? So let's talk about it. What are we missing? Or actually, look, you know, this, this student is performing consistently across all benchmarks. The bottom one really gets digs in a little deeper in terms of really looking at the specific areas. So for example, NWE math, besides the RIT, breaking it down, how do they do in quantitative reasoning, algebraic thinking. Um, it looks like a lot. It's to totally overwhelming to start, but the teachers have really um, 
taken this on in any time that there is an RTI meeting, a student who's considered for intervention, a bar meeting, there are multiple data points being brought any time they're talking about a student. So I guess the long, short answer is we've been doing this for a while. We collect multiple data points all the time to help us. Um, and the state makes it creative as they keep changing and, and helping us, or not helping actually, but making us kind of evolve our, our data walls as well. And then this was just, I don't know, a slice. If we want to look at spring uh, 23 three-year assessment and then spring 23 benchmark, these are just three examples, like third, fourth, and fifth grade. It looks like they're pretty much in alignment. The benchmark is the Fountas and Pinnell um, reading assessment. It is. Yes. Okay. Uh, have we compared May date data to our district data over the last few years? Does it show the same achievement level? If it's different, how so and to what extent? Uh, the honest answer is no. And I would say. I've worked in five different districts in different states, and no one's really put a lot of energy into delving into the NAEP for a few reasons. Um, there's no student school or SAU data available for the NAEP. It's just kind of a big picture, sample students in Maine, so you're never quite sure if your data is, in, is included in that. So it's just, it's an estimate, and it's hard to really, like, own it when you're not sure if you're students aren't even involved. Um, scores are frequently misinterpreted, which I'll go over in a second. And what NAEP measures is really different um, than what most state assessments measure. And again, this next slide is also on that ESSA dashboard. You could go on. This is not representative of MMS 8060. This is Maine and how they are performing on the NAEP assessment. This is fourth grade reading, I don't think I put that on there, um, from 2013 to 22. But what is confusing about how the scores are often articulated in the media or misinterpreted is that because it's a different assessment, the when you look at the blue, you think, oh, so you only have, if I'm looking at 22, 30 students who are proficient, writing at proficient, at advanced. But as actually at proficient is above grade level expectation. A student who falls in the basic range is meeting grade level expectations for reading and math. So that's not a common story that's thread through um, a lot of the newspaper articles and the media. Of course we want all our students to be above grade level, but I also think they should be you know, celebrated if they are meeting grade level expectations as well. So it's just not a data point that um, we've spent a lot of time on. And I guess Sue has the next piece on for the financial stuff. Oh, so that those are my questions. Yeah. yeah. So I don't. Sorry. I don't have in terms of. I think one of the questions, Josh, that you had asked was. Um, programmatically, what do we cost per pupil per program? Mm -hmm. And I'm working on that. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you that it's a, a simple awesome. answer, but we'll have information for you for in, in the budget process. Um, and I basically what I'm working on with poor Denise's help is um, crossing some year lines, like because I can give you information from last year. This year current is a little harder because we're in the middle of the year. So the costs are a little bit different. So I, I want to average them out a little bit and make sure that I give you pretty accurate numbers. So we'll have those for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That work will be about to us as we make decisions. Though. Yeah, exactly. Um, just a question. When, when I was researching the NAEP, I, like, I, I didn't read anywhere where it said that F ASIC has made grade level expectations. Is that written somewhere in it, the NAEP? Is it written it somewhere is. in the I can send I, it to you. I, that'd be great. I mean, yeah. I just matter of just yeah. me maybe just missing it or yeah. not reading in the right spot. Um, I did. I, I found it on the NAEP website, but I also spoke to the DOE uh, International National Assessment Coordinator, <laughs> and she had the same message. Fantastic. So just, 
just looking at this, like, uh, our, 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 we as a district, I mean, but that's, so looking at that, that's 60% are on grade level or above, right? You know, just looking at you know, uh, 2022 fourth grade reading. Yeah. Um, is that where we want to be as a district, or is there a different, we have a different goal in mind, and, and if we have a different goal, if, if we have a different goal in mind, you know, we want to be there. And I know that, the, I mean, I'm an educator, so I know the opportunity, oh, we're going to get as high as we can, but what what is our reasonable goal, knowing what our special ed population is, knowing what, how... We know a lot of our district. You've been looking at the data for a long time. Is this where we want to be, or, or are, we, are we trying to get somewhere else? Yeah, no, I think we've always had a goal of 85% proficiency and growth for all of our grades. We have definitely been creeping up towards there. Um, we didn't start off great, so I think we have made tremendous gains, especially in literacy. Um, so this feels okay, but not great. Like, we want to, you know... Yeah, at least 85%. Yep. And, and do we, and this is, a, this is a big question, right? Do we have a goal year when we want to hit that? Like, how long will it take us to get to 85%? Right. Because um, I, I think it's a fair question, right? Yeah. If we think about budgeting, obviously we don't just budget one year to one year. We plan multiple years. Yeah. Right? So, seeing that we're at 60%, how long does it take us to get to 85%? Right. It depends on how many times the state changes the test. Oh, amen. 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 Yeah. And I think and that's huge. Yes. 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 Like you get all the kids all set up. You know what they're doing. That directions how you do this and how it works, and then you change it. Right. It's a really, there's just some really interesting uh, information that's that's kind of on the cusp of coming out. I think in regards to Maine and how much. I mean, credit to you guys who who have been in, in this in this situation for a long time as as administrators and leading district. Maine has been through. Major changes like every five years. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sometimes every two years. And, and well, it's yeah. escalating now. It's like every six months. Yeah. Now, major initiatives now. So, like, there there are issues. So I guess I'm looking at is there a way? Is there a way for us as a school district, as a school board, to insulate our district from the major changes at the state level? Is there anything that we can do that can say it stops all of our administration from jumping from hoop to hoop to hoop? Instead, we just say, you know what? This is what we're going to do. This is our target, and you know what? Like, I don't know if there's a way to do that. I, I would love to know if there's a way to do that. Is it a matter of, you know, every single month, every single one of us as nine board members are writing a letter for all legislators saying, don't change a bloody thing because we need to just do well where we're at. Like, I, like what, what are the tangible things that you as our district leadership would ask us of as board members? And we have several community members here who are very interested in seeing our students' achievement levels jump too. Mm -hmm. Like, what empower us? What can we do instead of jumping from rock to rock to rock to rock? I, and that is a two-way because that goes not just for the state assessment, but there are curriculum review cycle, right? So there is a whole science behind implementation, and an effective implementation takes like seven years. Mm -hmm. But when you're chronically reviewing and changing things, and teachers are chronically having to change their instruction, so. That's a layer of it too, but um, I don't know. I don't know from. Well, I think it's a great question, and I yeah. think it's actually something that our administrative team can talk about. Yeah. To say, what are the things that would be helpful for us? What does it make sense for us to, like, I, I guess on the on the uh, the radical side of it, we don't participate in, like, the through your testing or whatever. We don't, you know, we can say, nope, we're not going to do that. Does that benefit us? Probably not in the long run. But the question of pushing to say, can we maintain the same level of testing for the same, like, can you give us five years, like, so we can get some good data? That is definitely something that we could ask for, like, with the main. I'm just in, a, in more of a basic sense, like, can we insulate our teachers from having to constantly, like, adjust? Like, the, the high point, if you look historically, the high point of, of main math instruction was the early 2000s, mid, mid to the 2000s. That was the high point. We've nosedived since that as a state. I'm not saying no right. necessarily. I don't know if our data correlates with that. We can sort of look at, well, what were we doing then that was so successful that we're not doing now? How are we spending our teachers' time? Well, right? and how, the, how have the past 23 years changed things as well, right. you know, in terms of that? There's, a, there's agree, a whole if level. We, if we see the nosedive, then that should cause a sense of urgency. We got us. Like, what are we doing that's not working? Right, so uh, these are big. These are big questions, and I think it's important. In my mind, I think it's important for our school board to be talking about big questions. Mm -hmm. Right, I think that that's our charge. We should be talking about big questions because 
We're supposed to be setting direction for our district, not responding to every month issue, right? And so I'm, I'm really wondering, how do I, how do I, as a board member, and, and hopefully I, I, I can speak for the board on this, how do we inspire, encourage, empower our administration and our teachers to be phenomenal educators to hit that 85% in whatever years we want to set. We want to set it in seven years, and so be it in seven years. It's got to be 10, it's got to be 10. And then every six months, we're getting reports, we're seeing the school data walls, and we're saying, oh, hey, we are on that trend, right? And our policies, our decision-making is getting there. So I'll stop. I mean, you, you hear what I'm saying, right? Yeah. And I, I apologize for asking maybe the detailed questions. You did a nice job of the data. I really appreciate your digging and explaining here, and you definitely left some phone numbers and people that we can talk to to gather more information. I, I really appreciate that. Um, so I, I want you to hear my appreciation. But I also want you to hear how, how, how do we empower you to get that 85%? Because I'm all about the 85%. I'm with you, and I know we can get there, but we got to stop jumping on stones. Yeah, I have a question. I don't know if you can answer this, but is our, our state funding tied into uh, these tests? Yes, you lose federal funding. So we don't do the test, Correct. we don't get money. Yes. Uh, that's what I thought. Yeah. As always. And fa fairness, right? Yeah. We can do the test yeah. and not worry about the data and say, you know what? We're focusing on our own data and, and that's what we're focused on. Yep, we'll have a day where they do it and, and we explain to our, our constituents, yeah, we're doing it because that's how we get state funds, but here's what we're actually focused on and look at our data. We're going to talk about what we've decided is important to follow for the next 10 years and see what happens, right? Does that change anything? Maybe, maybe our luck, right? Whatever the state changes for data, our standards are higher than what the state's asking them to do, and man, we are we are cooking. Um, that, that's that's what I'm proposing. Yeah, no, and I think like celebrating the things that are already in place, like this is just a state assessment is just one data point, right? Like we have other data points, like the amount of kids taking. I was talking to AJ, the amount of kids enrolled in college level courses, the graduation rate increasing, our local assessments at the elementary level. So I think remembering that it's just more than the state assessment as well. But well, and I think it is a good, it's a, it's a good reminder to all of our public that what is on the state website does not represent us necessarily. You know, that, and that's, that is a double-edged sword, right? Because that's what's reflecting on us right now, even though we do have these other um, data points that are really positive. But everybody goes to the state website and says, why are you not where you need to be, according to them? So those are, like, that's a great PR campaign that we need to do. And I think, in, in fairness, right, we yeah. have not clearly, right. in the long term, said yeah. what we are going to be all about, yeah. what we're going to put all our eggs in, what, what basket we put all our eggs in. Yeah. And yeah. if we did that then I think our communities can, for the most part, ignore the state. Because yeah. everyone knows, yeah, okay, this. Yeah. We're actually shooting above it, and this is why, and this is how, and this is how I'm measuring it. I'm on board with that, Josh. So, I think we awesome. could have that conversation, cool. for sure. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, and thank you, Shannon. Yeah, yeah. Yes. 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 Thank you. A lot of work. <clears throat> okay. All right, back up there. <laughs> 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 Yeah, I just need the remote. Thank you. I'm not sure. Yeah, the blue light. It's a little strong. Is the, the remote over there? The remote for the projector? I just want to shut it off because it's like the blue light. The blue light right in our faces. Thank you. Yeah, I did. What? All the buttons are. This comes up later. Okay. Safe is The agenda is the school revolving renovation fund grant update. Sure. So we, um, at the last meeting, were asked to know um, to share what some of the projects would be. Um, Don Bresnahan was in a couple of meetings ago talking about the grant and just went through it a little bit. And we found out today that we were awarded uh, for four of the schools. So I am handing this information out. Let's see. <laughs> 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 
and it's a lengthy, it's a big packet. So uh, what this represents is what John Bresnahan's Group Mechanical Services created for us and submitted on behalf of us uh, for the grants. And so right now, Noble High School was selected, the Hanson School was selected, the Knowlton School was selected, and North Hill Elementary School was selected uh, for upgrades, mostly as you look through this, uh, mostly for the HVAC um, and the air quality pieces um, and some other work. Uh, we, um, in the letter that we received, we need to um, initiate a, a kind of a financial, you know, with the bond bank, we need to reach out and let people know within 30 days if we're going to pursue this. So this is just informational for you at this time, but we don't have a lot of meetings before those that 30 days is up. We have one. So we really um, are hoping that you will be able to take a look at this over the next week or so, and if there are questions, if you could email us the questions so we'll be able to have them ready for the meeting so we can discuss this. Um, Denise, I don't know if you want to talk just a tiny, tiny bit about the, um, how this kind of goes. It's pretty exciting that we were chosen for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's and at least it gives us the opportunity. <coughs> we can make choices, but at least we have the opportunity. All, all eight schools had a um, had an application. So we were awarded approximately twenty one percent of the total amount the state had set aside wow. for these wow. projects. Um, and I think that uh, a lot of that goes to John and his team for being prepared to submit these within the timeline and get us to you know, give it the go-ahead to apply, and now we can do the work of deciding whether we want to go forward. So these projects will have to be done by September, I believe, of 25. Um, so it's a relatively quick turnaround. You would have two summers, in essence, to work on these projects. Um, you will see, I think you have the letters, the mm -hmm. award letters, mm -hmm. and what they do is they break out the total cost of the project, the amount that the state is going to give us as a grant, which means they forgive that portion, and I don't have the numbers, is it 51.27? 57.21. One. So that is um, <coughs> the amount the state pays to us for subsidy, so they take that same percentage and apply it here. The balance of it would be due by the district, and it's financed over 10 years with zero interest. So for projects that need to be done, um, the state is paying roughly 57%, and the rest is zero interest. So it's a really attractive way to get necessary projects done. Um, I, do, I believe I'm still researching this particular program, um, and I can have more information again for us next time. But this would, because the projects are not done, they don't hit the repayment cycle until they're complete. So I don't believe this would hit the budget until fiscal 26, um, because in 25, we'll still be working on completing it. Um, there is one note, though. I'm not sure which project was the it was two Nolten. Nolten. The Nolten School. School. Mm -hmm. So the Nolten School, if you look at that award letter, it shows the project cost at two million dollars even. And it again shows how much the state would forgive. But if you look at the information from Don, the the project actually cost two point three or two point four million. So there's three hundred thousand we would have to absorb into the district budget. Um, that for repayment um, or to pay for those costs as they come along. So that is something to be aware of. I think they capped it at two million per building. Per building. Wow. Well, this is a huge, huge thing. Thank them for coming. Yes. Us. Yes. Um, and as Audrey said, if you have questions, don't hesitate to send them our way. Um, it's an extremely busy time in the central office. Uh, we just are finishing up 1099s and W-2s, we're working on a budget proposal, we're finishing our annual audit, we've got lots of fun things going on, so, um, yeah.
Anybody yeah. have any questions right now? Or? I think the hope is, like, timing-wise. Mm -hmm. We really need to be poised to have a discussion and hopefully some sort of vote, whatever mm -hmm. that will be, at our next meeting. Not yeah. next week, but the week after. And I am pretty... Again, I'm working on the details of this. Yes. I am pretty sure this has to go as a separate question when we vote on our budget. Mm -hmm. And um, I would need to work with all three towns and their town managers or selectmen to um, have information to fill out the application for the main bond bank. We've done that before, and they said they've simplified it. So um, hopefully it's easier. Um, but that will also be part of our, our work in the coming months. It won't come, just a, maybe a quick question. I don't know. If you just if you say email it, I will. Email it. Okay. No, no. Um, on all of these, it says there's a big contingency and a construction contingency. In, in the history of projects that we've been doing here at MSA MSA D60, is that just lost money, or do we typically get that money back because you know things are on time, on budget? I'm, like, yep. What does so that number we, really mean to me? Is it actually spent or is it possible to come back? So part of the reason we have a contingency in these big construction projects is because the cost of everything is skyrocketing, right? Mm -hmm. And we, while we put things out to bid and we firm up those numbers, uh, there are sometimes cost overruns based on what they find, right? I remember the last, I believe it was the SRRF projects where we installed sprinklers in three elementary schools and did some asbestos abatement. Of the four projects, Two came in under budget, and two, two came in slightly over, or one, I think one actually, I think um, at Hanson, it came significantly over. Um, what they do is they give us, if we don't have to borrow all the money, we don't borrow all the money, so we get that back. Um, the contingency is really a common practice for all the construction. Um, so I think it's an important thing to be there, but if we don't use those funds and we can get costs lower than that, then the, they work to do that, and we get, um, they call it a launch. Uh, they get that launch money back. So um, if they will go up to the max. Anything, any cost we incur over what our projected budget is, we would have to cover. And then if we come in under budget, then we do, and they, they don't, they keep the money, the extra money, and we don't have to pay that back. They keep it, we don't use it. You okay. Thanks. Thank you. <coughs> and as you will see as you go through the packets, there are pictures of the schools. Some of the <coughs> Even though we took the tours, some of these are still striking. Okay. Um, and item six, Noble Community Employer Appreciation Breakfast Update. Sure. So we had a um, appreciation breakfast on Wednesday, which I think was the 24th last Wednesday, um, and we had about 50 folks here representing 25 or so businesses in the area, um, but several board members were here, so that was awesome too. Um, it was one of, it was a kind of a dicey morning, that Wednesday morning, we had the snow, so we were worried, but, ev but everybody showed up. Um, what we, what, it was um, developed by our transition coordinator at Noble High School, along with um, our two folks who are working in the um, external learning opportunities because it basically is like working on internships, job shadows, connecting our students to the community. So we had a lot of folks in, Estakia was also part of it, and uh, they. And then we sat down and did um, some roundtables and questions about what are employers looking for, what kind of skills do we need to be teaching our students, what are you missing, what can you, how can we partner with you to increase our of, you know, availability and, and sharing information. <coughs> so uh, it was great. It was great. We had really, really good feedback. Um, and I think, um, Peg, you were at my table, and there was a lot of talk about some of the soft skills, communication, leadership skills, um, just being proactive, motivated, all of the things that you're looking for in a good employee. So that was a, it was a really positive morning. I, I think our goal is to have these periodically throughout the upcoming years, honestly, just to try to continue that interactions. Talked a lot about how can we get students into our local businesses and learning some of the, the really specific um, skills that they need. And the trades we know is something that everybody's hurting in terms of like the next generation of students coming in. So we worked on, we talked about that quite a bit. Did you guys want to say anything? 
Because so who was with me? Let's see. Peg was here, and Victoria was here, and Alpha was here. Yeah. yeah. And Lauren was there, and, and Robert was here. So um, do you want to add anything? Yeah. No, it's just. We, oh, that's okay. Go ahead. It's just a really great day. We got a lot, a lot. There were a lot of people there. We had breakfast, and it was a great conversation. I think at every table, and they said it sounded like. At the when they were giving the presentation, that it like the, every table was together, you know, with the little tables. It's like the same conversations were happening at all tables. And I just that was great, and we, it was well presented. And good job. That's all I have to say. Good job to the team. They got a great job. We actually had some town um, leaders there as well. So we're select folks were here. So it was good. How about you, Hank? Yeah, I thought it was interesting because some of the things that that we think, or that some public members may think aren't important, business leaders actually found most important. Yeah. So, so social emotional skills yeah. were a huge topic. Yeah. We did not, I did not hear anybody saying you're not doing a good enough job with your academic teaching. We heard a lot about they want more support for social emotional skills and that that's the biggest challenge with, with the workforce. We also talked about the fact that it wasn't just specifically students that lack these skills, yeah. that actually it's all the folks coming into to people's employment, like, you know, just up, up to new employees in their 30s and 40s who are still not necessarily, like, really participating well, I guess is how I put that. But um, one of the things, um, Kyle Chandler was with us at our table and was talking about how, you know, he had people that, you know, came in for an event, never showed up for the job, or didn't show up for the interview. It's like just all kinds of things that were like, okay, we're, we're talking about an interesting job market, right, right now, too, as well. So. It was, it was really, really positive. Yeah, yeah. It was great. Okay. Next is employment. Sure, so we have two um, employment issues. One is a leave of absence for Cassie Thompson, and this is for the school year of next year. So it's the full year. She's just she's asking for a leave of absence. She's currently a teacher at Noble High School for English. So um, per the teacher's contract, if anybody's looking to have a leave of absence, they need to let us know prior to March. So that's why this request is now heading in. So um, for those new to the board, when we do have a leave of absence, we um, advertise for one year. So it's a one-year position, um, and that person that's hired knows that it's just for that, that school year. So if, if we were to approve the leave of absence, essentially we're holding the position what, when the year is over, they, they have the option to come back and take the same position or a position. Or, 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 a or an equivalent position. Yeah. Like yeah. Equivalent defined as not a kindergarten to twelfth grade. Yeah. yeah. But so something within their certification. certification. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 She's got her hand up. Thank you. <laughs> the next one is Abby Hubble, who is our director of school nutrition. And Abby um, is set to have a child this summer, a baby this summer. And she would just like to extend her maternity leave by four weeks, which would take us like the second week in September. So that is, we need a motion. I'll make a motion to accept that. Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you. She's got her hand up. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to just make it. Yeah, right this way. Yeah. yeah. Was She's actually... coughing right now. <laughs> 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 I'm just going to play by play. Yeah. That's pretty funny. As <laughs> superintendent of faith. Okay, just a few things. We, uh, Maddox Jordan, who is at the high school, has recently been named the 2023 Gatorade Player of the Year for boys cross country in Maine, and this is the first time that Noble has had a Gatorade Player of the Year. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. Uh, Congratulations. Pretty good. Cool. Yes, that is awesome. We have 10 students who will be earning six college credits in blueprint reading and machine shop principles through York County Community College, um, and they will begin their classes right on the campus, the YCCC campus right in Sanford. Um, so that's something that the high school has been working really closely with, and we're very excited to have that's awesome. those 10 students moving that way. Um, we also have, there's like this time of year, we have a lot of um, you know band and chorus and, and music competitions going on, so we'll be able to report on those when we have those um, pieces of information. I thought you might like to have a little information now on SRTC, which is Sanford Regional Technical Center. I know I feel like I'm volleying. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
So we have one of the largest groups um, attending SRTC, and we have 118 students right now that are, are that's participating. So I want to give you the numbers of applications. In 2019, SRTC, so that's York County, feeds into Sanford Regional Technical Center. So in 2019, out of all of the York County schools, 400 applications were submitted. 2023, for this school year, there were 645 applications. So this confirms what we know just about, you know, just off the offering and the challenges that, you know, everybody's seeing with, with the trades. And um, it's really exciting. We had the most, again, like every year our um, applications increase for this. And we, we had 118 slots. We get a lot of slots because we're a big school. But we still had a lot of students that were not able to participate. So this is why this um, YCCC is very exciting. We also partnered a little bit with um, some of, in New Hampshire, a little bit with um, Summersport yeah, yeah. for um, some technical um, classes there. What I want to pass around is just so that you can see um, Every couple of years, it's like a two or two and a half year cycle, the, um, the students in the building trades, electrical, plumbing programs, build a house. And the horticulture program assists with the landscaping. So it was up on the market for sale, and it did sell very quickly. But I just want you to see a picture of the house, so we'll set it that way when I come down. Um, yes. So. That's superintendents. Okay. Um, while that's circulating, we'll move to other. I was just going to say that um, Ski Club took place last month. It was a great program. It's third grade to high school. 153 kids participated. And it was just a really, we looked out had great weather all four weeks. Um, Rebecca Lee knows that program. She did a phenomenal job. It was her first year with it. And it was just a lot of fun. And so great to see so many kids like trying something not that we can't offer with enough. With, like, within our school, mm -hmm. outside of it. So. Um, do you know how many kids participate? 150. Oh, you just said that. I'm sorry. And then, sorry. Third grade. Uh, high school. Yep. Yeah, and then, year old. Um, where, what month did you guys go? Gunstock. Okay. Cool. Very nice. Other? Okay. We'll move to our last public input. Do you have any public input? back to the air quality issue you guys got a grant for, wouldn't it have been better for the school to contact us and say, hey, we noticed that, why it's missing a lot of school, is there a problem? And with me raising the issue that there might be a problem, it was never a, well, yeah, well, there might be a problem. Can we work together to try to solve this? It was immediately that we were not sending why it's school, even though he has medical reasons of not being there. I guess I just wanted to address that. Um, it was interesting that that came up, and I'm here tonight. Um, it would have been more productive had the school approached us in that manner, or even the board, the administration. I guess that's all I really want to say. <coughs> Working together for the benefit of the kids. Instead of alienating us. Thank you. Any other public input? Yeah. You all know me. I'm Kahuna Burke. There's a couple questions I want to throw out there. It was great about the employee appreciation breakfast update. I really see that you guys are trying to get something going there. Uh, I hope we follow through with this because it means a lot for our kids. It means a lot for the community. Our kids are our future. If you don't believe that, go out there and look at the job market. You know how many people are my age and older that are still working because the younger people don't want to step up. We need to get them more ambitious. We need to get them away from the 
cell phones in school, TikTok, all that stuff. You've been watching the news. You see what went down with Zuckerberg. Okay. The other question I have is, uh, what are the requirements for sports in this school? Is there a grade average that you need to keep up in order to participate in sports? Yes. That's what I want to know. Yep, that's good to know the questions. And I would appreciate it. You all know what this part was? It's a history book. It's a science book. It's a math book. It's everything you need to know. I would appreciate it if we do like the government does and the state and all the other uh, affiliations. Have a prayer after you say the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Any other public input? <coughs> Um, this DEI program is being taught in schools, social emotional learning. First of all, you aren't counselors, you're teachers. Second thing, DEI, diversity, that's racist right there to begin with. You know, teach kids because you're going to dress up like a woman, you're going to get the job over the person that worked hard for that job. You know, that's not the way we should be teaching, um, teaching our kids. You know, hard work is what gets the job done. It's spending time doing what it takes to earn that position. And the second thing is, 70% um, above, I don't believe that. I just saw the peer review study that shows we're 80% failure and north of that. I mean, when you have the military, 20% of the people joining the military came to sign their own names. Mm -hmm. And they have to use a computer, a special program for these people to get into the military because they have to sign their names. Um, you know, we're seeing kids, when I go in stores, they can't count change. They can't read a measuring tape. You know, we're looking for help everywhere, every industry we're looking for, we're looking for help. The kids don't want to step up. We're seeing that Mark Zuckerberg um, was in Congress yesterday apologizing to young kids killing themselves, suicides. Um, governor of, um, of Florida decided to take social media away from children, 16 years and younger. Other states are following because the problem we're seeing with mass <coughs> shootings is doing with bullying. And we need to take care of bullying. That doesn't just happen in school, it happens over social media too. We need to get back to the chalkboard, reading a book, using a calculator. Thank you. My name's Kevin Dutch, and you know me. I got something good to say for you tonight instead of having to chew you up. That's not my complaints. They're legit. I have one of your students here. He's a, um, he's a freshman, and he's sharp as a tack. He really is. He wants to learn how to repair cars, and I'm proud to have somebody here from this school that wants to get ahead. You don't have to go to college in order to be uh, indoctrinated. And he doesn't get that PC stuff and wokeness in my shot. So what I'm asking for you folks, maybe you could get him some textbooks or help him out, you know, to assist my work because he's taking time for my, uh, you know, production. But it's worth it. And uh, I believe in the future of uh, the auto repair. We're hurting. We really are. Go, if you can get your car fixed right away, then put you on hold. <laughs> His father's over there, and he's proud of him, so try to help him out. I'll okay. tell you who, who, who you are. AJ, talk to Mr. Yeah. Dutch, and yeah. we'll follow up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other public, <coughs> excuse me, public input? Sorry. Um, I work at Pratt Whitney. I'm 
been there for 20 years. It's my 20th year. Um, we just went through a huge hiring thing. I don't know. They were doing drive-through hiring events. They were doing public events. They even went to the Freiburg Fair. They went to the Acton Fair to get people to work. They were having a very hard time trying to fill a thousand jobs. So when I started there, there was only 920 people. Now it's 2,800. That's just in 20 years. Now, my question is to you, the whole school board, why can't we get more people in this school to teach people how to do machining? Machining is a big thing. When I started at Pratt 20 years ago, they said five years, you're going to be without a job because a robot was going to take your job. <laughs> that didn't happen. We need more people on the floor now than we've ever needed. And this school right here doesn't do anything to do with anything to do with machining. They don't have any, any programs. Everything gets sent to Santa or everything goes to YCCC. Why can't you guys get a program to send them straight to YCCC instead of going to San Diego? Thank you. Any other public input? Yeah, I won't go up to the podium. Many of our kids were involved in building that house. Not probably. In the Set 60. The Sanford Set 60. <laughs> How many kids? I don't have an answer. Yeah, we don't have an answer. Yeah, I don't have no, no six kids off the top. We didn't break it down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My brother did that course right there 35 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. I got something. Uh, my name is Chris Whitley. I'm a master plumber, and I work in Pratt <laughs> 30 years, and I've been called back because we don't have the kids that want to learn the jobs anymore. Thank you. So I see it every day, and I'm 70 years old, and I'm back in the workforce. Thank you. Any other public input? So next on the uh, agenda is executive session. So for the public, we will not have any more public um, conversation after this, so you can go home and be safe. Thank you guys for coming.